So what is apophatic theology? Um, I'll begin by offering a preliminary definition. Uh, apophatic theology as theology done in the acknowledgement of the failure of all language with respect to God. Now that sounds quite extreme and I hope that will be borne out in the following why one might want to put it quite so extremely um, and that it's not just an exaggeration that all language fails in respect of God. Uh, but it does also immediately raise a problem which is that uh, theology by definition one would have thought is speech about God. Um, so what's theology um, doing when it's purporting to speak uh, about a God uh, in respect of whom all language fails? And again, I hope by the end I'll have amassed some resources with which to address just that problem. Uh, I want to start by clearing away uh, misapprehension, which is very pervasive. I mean, if you look up apophatic or theology or apophaticism um, on Google, you'll very quickly get the impression that it is theology done by way of negation uh, in terms of saying what God is not. And then that's contrasted with the cataphatic, uh, which is defined as theology done by way of affirmation uh, through affirmative language about God. Now it's true that the apophatic and the cataphatic are paired, but I'd suggest not as the neg negative to the affirmative. And Dennis Turner is particularly helpful in pushing one beyond this kind of caricature of apophatic theology in his The Darkness of God. Uh, and he's drawing particularly heavily on Pseudo Dionysius, whom I'll come back to a little bit later. And he suggests that the apophatic element is precisely the failure of all language with respect to God. In other words, not just affirmations, but negations also fail in respect of God, because they're just as much part of creaturely speech as affirmations are. So when we say that God is not evil or God is not bodily, uh, we're still drawing God within uh, the structures of our creaturely thought and language. Uh, and given that God uh, transcends those, those phrases, um, those, that kind of language fails just as much as the corresponding affirmations do. God is good uh, and God is immaterial. All forms of creaturely speech fail. Um, that's the apophatic element. Uh, and that's then contrasted with the cataphatic element, what well, contrasts is not paired is, the, is a better word, uh, as um, the fact that theology is precisely done through speech. Um, one only reaches apophasis by way of speech. The apophatic is not um, prior to speech, it's not a silence prior to speech, it's a silence beyond speech. So you can only break through to it by going through um, speech and then showing up how it fails. So in other words, the failure of language is beyond language rather than before it. Uh, and let me just give an example from Pseudo Dionysius, um, who talks about God as dazzling darkness. I mean, here we have uh, an apparent oxymoron uh, where two things are juxtaposed um, about God. Uh, they can't both be true. Um, bright and uh, uh, dark tend to contradict one another in the creaturely sphere. So the point of putting them together in the context of God is to show that God uh, transcends the distinction between darkness and light. So uh, two um, words are put together in ways that cancel each other out and point to a God who can't be captured in either, um, in either word. And oxymoron is, is something I'll come back to a little bit later as, as one mode of pushing language to its collapse. Let me backtrack a little and uh, tell you about apophatism more widely. So it can be used both to refer to a tradition of thought, or indeed traditions of thought, and to refer to uh, an approach to theology um, in general. I, I more want to concentrate on the latter by um, uncovering some of the, the, the logic um, that we might want to apply in thinking about God apophatically. But I'll give you some orientation points to start with. Um, apophatic ways of thinking are prevalent in both the East and the West, and indeed in the patristic period I'd say that apophatic modes of thought are abso fun absolutely fundamental to doing theology to core. But nevertheless we might name in the East um, figures like Gregory of Nyssa or Maximus the Confessor um, as uh, particularly apophatic theologians. Um, and in the West, although more controversially, one might point point to Augustine as someone whose theology is fundamentally apophatic. And indeed, it's on um, the trajectory in the West that I want to draw in the following. However, starting uh, with Pseudo Dionysius, um, whom I've already referred to, who is writing in Greek, but he becomes um, a massive influence in the Latin Western apophatic tradition. 
Uh, and um, let me say a little bit about him first and his ways of thinking. So Pseudo Dionysius uh, styles himself. He writes as if he were um, the Dionysius, the Areopagite mentioned in Acts 1734, uh, named as one of the people Paul converts when he's preaching in Athens. Um, his pseudonymity is then much later discovered, uh, and he's now dated to around the end of the 5th, early 6th centuries, um, mainly because it's very clear that he's thoroughly indebted to a Neoplatonic philosopher named Proclus, writing in the 5th century. Uh, and uh, that suggests that uh, it's roughly then that he was, that he was writing. So um, one of his key achievements is a thoroughgoing integration of Neoplatonic philosophy on the one hand and Christian theology on the other hand. Uh, he draws on the hierarchical um, thought structure of Neoplatonic um, philosophy and he understands God by analogy with one of Neoplatonic philosophy as beyond off the top of the chain of the hierarchy of creation. And then he develops ways of speaking which um, utilise this hierarchical scheme, so going, taking you both up and down the chain of being, um, but in order to, uh, to point to a God who is beyond all hierarchy. So, for example, uh, when he, he does this both by way of affirmation and by way of denial, in both cases um, doing so apophatically, just to reiterate my point from before. Um, and we've seen already that on the um, affirmative side, he'll use oxymorons to point to a God who is beyond all creaturely speech. Uh, it's a little bit more difficult to show how negations fail, but I'll attempt to do so. So in, in this mode, he moves up the chain of being, starting with that which is furthest away from God, as it were, with um, material creation. And he then denies that God is bodily. And then he successively de denies all the rungs of the ladder of creation until he gets to the top, and um, there too denies that God is mind. And once you get here, you, you might look back to where you started um, and say, oh, wait a minute, but when uh, he said that God is uh, not bodily, I assume that he, that he said that because God uh, is mind. Uh, but once you've taken away the alternative to, um, to bodily, you've undercut um, the possible meaning you might have given to the phrase God is not bodily. And so the negation, which really only functions by way of comparison and contrast with other creaturely forms, is undercut as a form of speech which can really give you any handle on God. Um, and so negations too, just like affirmations, are shown to fail. And they do so um, by way of this hierarchical structure in pseudo Dionysus is thought. Uh, the rather interesting thing about that is that um, his way of articulating the transcendence of God um, is bound up with a very particular philosophical idiom. And this might make some rather suspicious of this whole way of doing theology because it buys into an alien Greek philosophy, as it were, which might seem to be, uh, be seen to be a distortion of uh, a, a biblical, a more pure biblical faith. So it's clear that Pseudo Dionysius is articulating his apophatic theolo theology uh, uh, by using a particular philosophical idiom. And this might make some suspicious of the whole endeavour, uh, insofar as it's indebted to a Greek philosophical idiom, which may not be thought to be true to the biblical faith. Indeed, some have called it um, a distortion of a more pure biblical faith. Uh, we might name someone like Jürgen Moltmann or Robert Jensen as figures today who will draw such a distinction. They do so with some nuance. Um, uh, and give their own narrative of the relation between the two. But nevertheless, they want to move away um, from uh, a God articulated too much through Greek philosophical thinking. However, I'd want to suggest in the case of Pseudo Dionysius that if one looks closely, what he's doing is actually transforming his Greek philosophical idiom by putting it to Christian theological ends. And that, that actually uh, gives us a kind of template um, for what we should do in any uh, new age. Um, by borrowing the philosophy that's available to us and putting it to the distinctive ends of Christian theology. Uh, and so that we should precisely learn from him in this respect. Uh, I want now to turn to um, some key roots for, think for, well, for, for the question, for the fundamental question, uh, why is God beyond speech? Why might we want to claim that at all? Uh, and it might be easy to say, well, God is transcendent, God is other. 
Um, and that's not untrue, uh, but again, it can easily be misunderstood. Um, so when we say God is transcendent, we might immediately think that puts God in some kind of opposition with creation as the timeless to the temporal or the infinite to the finite or the unchanging to the changeable. Uh, uh, but if we follow through our apophatic theology um, in a more thoroughgoing way, it in fact pushes beyond any such contrast between God and creation. Um, and that's precisely why apophatic theology can't simply be by way of denial, because other, otherwise we will simply end up by saying God is not creation and we simply have an opposition. So what it's doing instead is to point to a God who transcends all such oppositions. And therefore, when we say that God is eternal, we don't simply mean just the opposite of time. And this is, again, something that's sometimes misunderstood by those theologians who too much pit a Greek philosophy against a biblical faith, as if some of the, those classical attributes apparently borrowed from Greek philosophy are um, moving away from a more living God of the Bible by telling you that God is somehow in opposition to creation. So apophatic theology pushes us to a God who is um, beyond all creaturely distinctions. And we might want to um, draw on a wonderful phrase by Meister Eckhart, that God is distinct by virtue of being indistinct. Uh, so to get a handle on the kind of transcendence that we're talking about in respect of God, not just as opposition with creation, I'm going to pinpoint two Christian doctrines which I think are at the root of thinking about a God who is beyond speech. One is the doctrine of creation out of nothing, creation ex nihilo. The other is the doctrine of divine simpleness or simplicity. I'll start with the doctrine of creation ex nihilo. Um, and uh, this initially tells us that God does not create out of something.